Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming on a Friday to this, uh, I hope, very exciting uh, for you um, public uh, lecture. Um, you would hear in a moment a uh, very brief introduction um, for our distinguished guest, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, CEO of the World Bank. Um, before um, going into this introduction, let me just set some um, ground rules and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Simeon Diankov. I am the director of the Financial Markets Group at the London School of um, Economics, and we are the sponsors of this, uh, of this public lecture series. Um, as you have seen in the, uh, in the announcement, uh, our featured guest has uh, uh, a long and distinguished uh, public service uh, um, profile. Um, there are many things that can be highlighted uh, that are relevant for the presentation tonight. Um, I would highlight just a few of those. Um, Kristalina Georgiev uh, has a very dis distinguished career at the World Bank, where among her many accomplishments, one accomplishment, which perhaps we'll spend some time discussing uh, uh, tonight, uh, was her work on um, the environment and on climate change. Her team at the World Bank some years back uh, was behind many of the significant innovations in public policy in terms of combating the effects of uh, climate change. Uh, started, among other things, uh, what now is known as green bonds uh, that have become one of the main public uh, response instruments to the effects of, uh, of degradation of the environment. Um, Kristalina has done a number of other things for Europe. She was European Commissioner for a number of um, years, precisely in the difficult years of the uh, Eurozone uh, crisis, and actually a few other crises. <laughs> With uh, that, she was named uh, European Commissioner of the Year in 2010, and perhaps even more importantly, European of the Year, um, something that, uh, that um, testifies to her many accomplishments uh, and contributions to Europe. Most recently, uh, she is the CEO of the World Bank uh, and uh, runs an organization uh, that uh, has office in about 160 countries around the world, many different areas of work, which uh, we'll hear some uh, tonight. But the way that I would perhaps uh, finish and uh, like you to, um, to remember our distinguished uh, uh, speaker tonight is that she's an LSE alumnus. Um, so um, uh, so with, uh, with uh, that, uh, I hope that what she brings back home, and welcome home, Kristalina, is, uh, is a view of, um, of um, financing development, but financing development more broadly across, uh, across the world. Um, we will run uh, tonight's lecture as follows. Um, our speaker will have about half an hour for some introductory remarks, and then we will have plenty of time for, um, for questions. I will take questions in groups of three so that we are more uh, efficient, so that as you hear to the introductory remarks, please prepare your, your questions. With that, Kristalina, welcome home, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and a very good evening to all of you. I look around the um, audience. It seems to me that majority of you are younger than 30. Those that are younger than 30, raise your hand. Younger than 30. Whoa. OK. <laughs> so long, long time ago, before you were born, <laughs> September 87, I came to LSE as a um, uh, scholar, part of the professionals on the other side of the Iron Curtain at that time that were, during the days of perestroika, allowed to apply for, for British Council scholarships. Uh, when I came here, everything was so very new and very different from what I had experienced before, uh, including, I can say this with a bit of nostalgia, being able to open my very first bank account in the bank around the corner. Uh, and then uh, later, 
I went back to, the, to Bulgaria. I wrote the first microeconomics textbook. I'm very proud of that. It is still a bestseller. <laughs> because it was written for people who know nothing about market economy. So it had to be simple. And then uh, I went to MIT and then to the World Bank. And um, the rest is history. I'm here as the CEO of the World Bank. But I want to start with how I experienced getting into the World Bank the first time it happened. Um, as it is here at LSE, also at MIT, dressing down is the norm. But for going to this very big institution, the World Bank, I put my very best suit. It was brown with flowers. <laughs> I walked into the main building of the World Bank, looked around, walked out, and bought a dark blue suit. <laughs> so I can fit. <laughs> and I can tell you I'm returning to the bank, no dark blue suit anymore. As you can, as I can demonstrate here in front of you. My point here is that we live in a world that is changing quite rapidly. The days I grew up under communism, the days of transition, entering the World Bank before Jim Wolfenson became a president, a very conservative uh, institution, practically almost no women uh, working there. And the days today, huge change. And what is very important for us to recognize is that the speed of change with time gets faster. And the impact change has on institutions, on individuals, on societies, more profound and more difficult to cope with. If you look at the most positive of changes, science and technology, yes, they generate, they generate incredible opportunities everywhere. But they also generate unintended consequences. For example, connectivity allows us all to very quickly exchange ideas, and it also allows very bad people to organize to do very bad things. Uh, my president, the president of the World Bank here at LSE, said technology brings aspirations to a very uh, compressed place. In other words, aspirations converge. We all know everything about everything everywhere. But opportunities do not converge as fast or they don't converge at all. And what we have is massive disappointments. And we have, of course, uh, an accordion of inequality uh, being opened like this. I have a favorite story about technology, and it is the following. When I left the World Bank to go to the uh, European Commission, my staff at that time sent me out with a very jazzy, sexy present. They queued in the United States 48 hours to get it. And it was an iPad. Last year, I'm talking to my granddaughter how life used to be when I was her age, five. And I said, there was no TV, there were no computers. She looks up at me and says, so you only had iPads. <laughs> and that actually is the, the first and most important message I want to convey to you, that we have to be much more adaptable. We have to face rapidly changing circumstances, some for, for good, some for bad. And that puts to the 7.3 billion po uh, people on this planet an environment to operate that is not necessarily easy. And it is particularly not easy for people that are left behind 
and not easy for those that are left furthest, furthest behind. I want to start from what we often take pride of, the fact that during the last decades, we have made it possible, we human race, we have made it possible for poverty around the world to go dramatically down. In 81, 42% of the people on this planet, and then they were 4.5 billion, were poor. What is the percentage today? Who knows? Some guesses. Well, <laughs> what? Three? Yeah. Ten. It is just around 10%. So we have 7.3 billion, 3 billion more people, but the number of, pe of poor people has shrunk from 1.9 to 800. And this is really impressive. Most of this shrinkage came from one very big country. Anybody here from China? <laughs> from your motherland. Uh, where from 660 million people living in poverty, today we are down to 25 million. But if you are one of the 800 million still living in poverty, success somewhere else doesn't mean much to you. And what I want to bring to you as young people is particularly the fact that while, while we have poverty going down globally, there are places on this planet where extreme poverty climbs up. My professor of statistics here at LSE used to say that, about averages, used to say that you can put your head in the refrigerator, you can put your feet in the oven, your temperature would be average, but you will be dead. <laughs> <laughs> and when we take the fate of people where what they see around them are drivers of misery and destitution, it is our duty to concentrate on the reasons why why is it that in, in 12 countries, the percentage of people living in extreme poverty has gone up? Why is it that in another 18 countries, while percentages stay stable, the absolute number of people living in poverty has gone up, more than 500,000? And the answers are in front of us to see. The biggest driver for extreme poverty to grow, wars. Whether we talk about South Sudan, where extreme poverty has gone up staggering 26% to 71% now, here. Meaning that 5.1 million people don't know whether they would survive the next day. Or we are talking about Syria, where a former middle-income country saw itself tear to pieces to a point that 60% of the Syrian people today live in poverty, either in Syria or as refugees elsewhere, in Jordan, in Turkey, in Lebanon, or here in Europe. The second big driver of poverty going up, up, is natural disasters. Uh, I'm sure you have watched Hurricane Imra and, sled, uh, and after it Maria washing out the Caribbean islands. Dominica lost the equivalent of 200% of its GDP just in the hours being swept by, by Maria. Natural disasters, unfortunately, are on the rise, both in numbers and in intensity. And the most significant driver of that is, of course, climate change. And if, if, when, I, when I think of, of reasons sometimes to lose sleep, war, 
and climate change is what makes me waking up in the middle of the night worrying that we are not doing enough to address these this, uh, risks. These are very difficult challenges, but there is a third one that is actually easier to address and we are still falling behind, and it is population growth. Uh, are there Bulgarians in the audience aside of uh, Simeon and me? Okay, dobar večer. Uh, here is a story that, that I, I, I was quite shocked by, and then I talked about it uh, in Niger to the government of Niger of a dinner. In 1960, my, our country, Bulgaria, and Kenya, anybody from Kenya? Excellent. So we had the, uh, we can make it more personal, <laughs> were next to each other in the population tables. Bulgaria had 7.9 million people, Kenya had 8.1. Today, the population of Kenya is what, around 44 million? A bit higher, hmm? a bit higher. 45? 47. 47, <laughs> okay, well, uh, this is my, my, number, my numbers from uh, uh, 2012, and that on its own <laughs> tells you something. And uh, Bulgaria has officially 7.3. So we have a demographic problem of our own. But this is what I told the government of Niger when I told them this story over dinner. By the way, a dinner, one of these dinners, you go there, you have to be polite, they're very polite, I'm very polite. We are all kind of counting time, so dinner is over. Until I told them this story. And I said to them, I just don't know how my country could function. And I'm asking here the Bulgarians, can you imagine Bulgaria with 47 million people? I cannot. And then what happened at that dinner is, boom, big discussion. Prime Minister saying, oh, but you know, Niger, plenty of land. We can have many more people. And uh, his minister for social affairs, a woman, says, oh, come on. We have land, but nobody can live on this land. So we have to think about this issue. And, and on a very serious note, yes, we have to not only think, but act decisively on this issue. Why? Because if a country like Niger grows at 3% and its population grows at 3.1%, where is poverty going to disappear? And that concentration on the factors that would lead to population growth being slowed down from getting girls in school and making sure they stay there and they learn, addressing the tremendous injustice of getting young girls married against their will. Uh, do you know how many, how, well, let me ask you this question, how was your day today? <laughs> Good? Great. Great? Okay. On this great day of ours, 41,000 girls under 18 got married. Many of them against their will. And of course, when you, when you marry early, you have kids early, you have more kids, the kids are not that healthy, you're not that healthy, you're not productive. We did a report in the bank, we calculated that the 15 million early marriages every year wipe out about $2 billion of wealth from the developing world. We know that when women are able to contribute to society, when they are employed, usually, not always, but most of the time, number of children goes down. Um, I have one daughter, professional woman. I should have had more, but I, actually I do have an excuse. Uh, between my brother and me, we have an average of three children. He has five, I have one. <laughs> yeah, good. But on a very serious note, we know that when women are employed, they contribute to their families, to their societies, and also population growth trims down quite rapidly. The, there are all kinds of assessments. Overall, the, 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 the uh, analysis tells us that women fully empowered would bring some 12 to 28 
trillion dollars. In other words, if, if women are equal everywhere, the world economy would be between 12 and 28 trillion dollars bigger. Even if it is not 12, we are on the lower end and we overshot and it's 10 billion. We know that to meet the uh, sustainable development goals, we need around 7 billion a year, 5 to 7 billion a year, a trillion a year more. So gender equality can resolve a big problem. And it is certainly hugely important for countries that are, that where people are destitute and the number of destitute is going up because pop of population growth. And the fourth reason, one that, that, that is incredibly important to, 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 to not overlook is bad governance. Uh, Zimbabwe has no reason to be a poor country. Haiti has no reason to be very different from the Dominican Republic. And if you look at why is what is happening is happening, it boils down to in Haiti, papa dog, baby dog, uh, all the government problems that they have been carrying for years. And it is governance where we as an institution have a particularly significant responsibility to carry. So what can we do about it? Well, let me, let me first start by recognizing that it is our moral duty and it is our duty as institution working on development to concentrate much more attention and financing where it matters the most. And I'm proud to say that the World Bank got an incredibly strong vote of confidence with the replenishment of the International Development Association funding this year. $75 billion. This is 50% more than what we got last time around. We are really blessed to have more money, but to make use of this money, we ought to place people where the problems are. So traditionally, uh, you think of the world banker like Mr. Simeon Diankov, suit, tie, high corridors of power. David, get up, <laughs> get up. But this is what now the new world banker looks like. <laughs> Um, he actually put a jacket for you guys, otherwise he would be in his shirt. Majority, majority of people we now recruit to work in fragile countries actually do work and live in very often dangerous conditions. They connect to communities. They make sure that every step we can take to provide development opportunities to people, we do take. But that is not good enough. Our 75 billion either, as good as it is, that is not good enough. And what we are concentrating a lot these days are two other things. One, how to get private sector to overcome fears of risks and be more present and active in more vulnerable countries how to give the certainty that they can invest, reap off the benefits of investment, and by doing so, improve the lives of people. We now are working everywhere in countries, in middle-income countries. By the way, middle-income countries is where still 50% of the poor people live. But especially in higher risk economies, to make sure that jobs can be created, that SMEs can, can flourish, that there can be a hope for turning a page to a better future. The second thing we do is to look at innovation financing that can be a key to more prosperity in countries vulnerable, both to conflicts, but also in particular to natural disasters. Uh, Simeon mentioned that we invented at the World Bank the uh, uh, green bonds that are now massively floating, uh, especially here in, the, in this great city of London. 
Uh, we started in 2007. Today, the uh, green bond market is uh, way over $120 billion. Our share in it is $10 billion. So you can see we are now, we can say we, we gave birth to something that has life on its own. Much more interesting is trying to bring insurance to work for poor people. We in the rich world, for years, have been using insurance to bring down risk of shocks. Why not make that available to poor countries and to poor people? So we started uh, some seven, eight years ago, issuance of catastrophic bonds. So we bring together a group of countries in the Caribbean, 16 countries. By being together, the risk goes down. And then they buy insurance, and when the horrible thing happens, as it happened this year, they immediately receive funding that can help in the relief. The Caribbean, Caribbean islands got $50 million from their insurance right now, immediately. And you cannot imagine how valuable speed of financing in a, in after disaster is. And then what we want is to turn this in instrument into incentive for people to do the right thing. So if a country has land management policy for forestry to be protected, not to be chopped, chopped down, then the insur insurance premium ought to have a discount. And we are funding, as, as a donor, as a finance community, we are funding discount, this discount. The most, the jazziest thing we have done this year is a pandemics bond. Remember Ebola? When Ebola hit, uh, one of the most tragic things was that until donors mobilized enough funding on a scale, the scale became huge. So we were running after a problem, and in the end, it cost a couple of billions of dollars. What we are saying is, why not use these instruments that help us to sleep well, uh, you know, not being worried about, about diseases or fire. So we issued the first ever pandemics bond. What it is, is to provide donor money to pay for a coupon on the bond against the buyer of the bond taking the risk that pandemics may happen. So if you buy $100 uh, of this bond, because the risk of pandemics is uh, not negligible, you would be getting 11 cents on your dollar as income, high yield. But if there is pandemic, you lose your money. And we get 550 million to invest in immediate action. These kinds of innovations that allow us to speed up action and support countries, but also send signals and be able to measure the risk. Because once the insurance industry becomes part of it, guess what? They are incredibly useful for us to understand the profile of risk of different countries and then manage development investments accordingly. Let me finish with what I believe in the end of the day is going to be most important as financing. And it would be investing in people, investing in education and health and jobs in countries that are vulnerable, investing day after day and year after year. We just published a report on education. Bottom line of the report is we have a crisis. Schooling is not learning, and learning is not employability. And massively in the developing world, we have kids at age of 10 who don't know how to read. We have teachers who don't know how to teach. We have teachers who don't go to work. In some countries, absentee among teachers is 50% of the time, 60% of the time. That has to change. And why does it have to change? Because, going back to my granddaughter that is uh, iPad proficient, <laughs> the jobs of today and tomorrow, especially of tomorrow, they would require different skills 
than what we have been trained. But they more than anything else would require to learn to learn, to be able to turn learning into a lifelong experience. And it is not going to happen in the developing world without determination and investments in people. I am uh, uh, keen to tell you that you guys have a chance to do what is necessary for the world to be more stable. You can, you can swing around threat like climate change. And you can also, by the way, you invest, make it so that there is more equality. We are thinking of moving significantly in the impact <coughs> investing area. When I say we, I mean at the World Bank. We want to be able to show results you can get for your money. And I very much hope that you, with your brains, your smart, otherwise you're not going to be at LSE, <laughs> your hearts, your sense of common purpose, you can bring on scale the innovations that I talk about. And you can make it possible for investing to turn into a social good for the world as a whole. But we can only do that if we continue to be global citizens, if we continue to be thinking of ourselves as belonging to one humanity, to one community. I'm not going to talk about Brexit. <laughs> but that is maybe not the very best way to promote being one community and staying together. I want to finish with a quote from Robert Frost, who said, before I built a wall, I would ask to know what I am walling in and what I am walling out. And maybe it is best just not to build a wall. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kristalina. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will immediately start with uh, taking your questions. I'll take uh, in groups of um, Three, and I'll start first left to right, and then right to left uh, at uh, the top, so that we have some uh, way of organizing it. The lady in the front. And please introduce yourself briefly. and our governor. <laughs> One is um, Facebook mm -hmm. and Zuckerberg's, you know, let me give free internet to all of Africa mm -hmm. in an incredible gesture which has very commercial in every way. Now, in some ways, is Facebook one of your competitors? Mm. And the other possible competitor is China. Mm -hmm. Because China goes in there and gives money and builds roads and everything, and there are no conditions. Thank you. A couple more questions, the lady in the middle. And please wait for the mic to come to you. A bit louder, please. Mm -hmm. There is the UN and then there is other big actors. So how can you coordinate all of yep. this manpower and effort in order to best meet the uh, fragile states and needs? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the gentleman next to you. Hi, uh, my name is Ozafa. I'm actually an MBA student at Kansas School. My question to you is, um, 
given that one of the challenges to meet your development needs is to invest in education uh, to provide future jobs for uh, 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 elderly property, for example. Um, what threats do you see in terms of your actions against the forces of automation, forces of uh, technology that you know you mean you're educating someone now, but in five, ten years time, yep. their jobs are taken away. Thank you very much. Okay. You can organize so, the answers. Let, let's take that. Uh, to, to your first question, I am a very big believer that uh, global public goods, original public goods, do require public funding and public engagement. Uh, take the issue of uh, digital identity. We are struggling now to come to grips with the fact that Identity documents, documents in the future are not going to be paper. They're going to be, we are moving towards digital. Well, if you are one of the, some 1.1 billion people without, identi without document of identity, why give you a paper and then move you to a digital? We should do it right now. And we should build it as a public good. Uh, in other words, uh, engaging that we from the bank are putting uh, soon to be $1 billion in moving towards digital identity, uh, including for refugees. So when they travel, they, you know, they, they know, we know who they are. Uh, but also to populations where there is no registry, there is no date of birth. I was talking uh, recently, that, that really struck in my, in my mind. I was talking to a woman uh, and I was asking her how old she was. She said, I don't know, but I think I was born in 82. I think I'm born in 82. And I cannot, I, so non-educated, she cannot count how many years are from there to now. But that is the, these are the people we are talking about when, when, we, when we want to get a, a movement of identity. Now, why am I connecting this to, to your question on Facebook? Because, of course, we can say, let the private sector do it. And then the financial community would come up with IDs that on one side are IDs, on the other side are credit cards or, or debit cards or, or banking instruments. On face value, nothing wrong with that. Except that if people are not educated, they don't know a commercial, they, would soon, they may soon be dragged into debt they cannot bear. So, to answer, your, to answer your point, I believe that, that there are areas of digitalization that have to be pursued as public goods. We can bring the private sector to be a partner. They can be offering their superior knowledge on technology. But they cannot be funding it and putting it out because, of course, they would do it with their uh, commercial interest. And frankly speaking, this is their responsibility to their shareholders. Um, so that, that on your Facebook uh, question, we need to take, we need to bear, we need to, public sector has to bear responsibility in some areas. Uh, China and, uh, uh, actually that would go straight to the question on the regional banks, the UN. I mean, China, yes, they started quite massively investing in uh, Africa, no strings attached, but they have done that quite a lot at the time when Africa was booming. Well, Africa is not booming anymore. Commodity prices collapsed. You look at countries like Zambia or Cameroon and what is happening there, of their economies. And so China is now saying, well, maybe working with others on building debt is not a bad idea. Because what if all these debt instruments we put out lead to nothing as return? Uh, China, China is engaging more. You all know about the infrastructure, uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, that is where I'm going to shift straight to the regional banks in UN. Uh, look, the needs, the investment needs in the world are huge. There is space for everybody. But if we don't coordinate, the whole would be smaller than the sum of individual parts. So there is need for coordination. Traditionally, it falls on the World Bank to be more of a platform to bring the other banks together. 
We just did that on dealing with migration and forced displacement. We brought everybody together so we can have a coordinated approach. I wouldn't hide from you, uh, and by the way, with the UN, we do have a very important change of approach that is happening over the last years, and it is bringing development and humanitarian action more holistically together. Uh, I'm not going to hide from you. When you have more participants, it becomes a little bit like herding cats. But more often than not, especially when it comes down to very serious investment decisions that we make collectively, we actually come on the same uh, page. Uh, and uh, we have, we, there are needs of, <laughs> of, of different nature, like in the United Nations. The World Bank cannot ever substitute for the political process that the United Nations uh, hosts. Neither we should. It's none of our, our comparative advantage. Uh, we do need leadership in these institutions, and I would put myself in, the, in that category. We need all of us to recognize our responsibility is to work together. Uh, and it is uh, uh, something that China is recognizing more and more. Uh, education and, and, uh, and automation. This is actually a very, very um, pressing uh, question. Because what we see is that uh, not only the quantity of education in developing countries is not sufficient, but the quality of education is way, way, way falling behind. Uh, in fact, this is the case for not just for the developing world. Uh, I was with a very senior Singaporean not long ago. Singapore last year was number one in PISA, number one. So what do I do? I turn and I say, congratulations. He looks at me and says, for what? That we are number one of a test of the 20th century means nothing anymore. Just mechanical learning. So we have to face the future. We are doing our next World Development Report on the future of work and what automation, artificial intelligence, structural shifts would mean for the developing world. Simeon is going to be a big part of that uh, process. We are asking some very difficult questions. For example, you, have you studied demographic dividend? Have you? I mean, Maybe you have. Maybe useful to mention yeah. briefly. Okay, so you have demographic dividend when you have young population that is bigger than your elderly, and they work, and everybody lives happily ever after. <laughs> Are we going to have demographic dividend or a demographic disaster? There are 600 million people to come to the labor market over the next year, years until 2030. 400 million likely to be in the developing world. If no more manufacturing is moving the way it used to be to move from uh, high labor cost to lower labor cost, uh, what is going to happen in these countries? Where are the jobs going to come from? And I, we don't, I, I wouldn't pretend even remotely that I have an answer to this question, but I know that we have to work it out. And it is not going to be a question that we can frame and put on the wall. It's going to be a constant um, sort of adapting by, by, by learning from, from experience. Uh, what we do know, however, and we know that for sure, there is this thing called no regrets policy. Well, getting quality education that is oriented more not towards just me mechanical learning but towards uh, uh, social skills and intelli intelligent behavior and adaptability. We know this is going to be good. We know that having a um, adaptable labor force, making people realize that it's not going to be a job forever. When I, when I, when I started in, in 75, God, I'm so old. When I started in 75, I thought that I will work as a professor, boom, 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 up the, the, the ladder, and I would retire at 55. Here I am in front of you. I'm 64. I have no intention to retire anytime soon. And I have changed I don't know how many jobs in, in, in the process. And that's me. 
And you know, guess what? Yours is going to be much, 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 much more roller coastery. <laughs> so we get to we have to get people to to recognize that and and make it not a threat and all oh, scary, but make it the opportunity and the way we work and live. And of course, that would require society that is inclusive and caring, because obviously, if you don't have that, it's going to be a very, very tough roller coaster ride. Thank you. Next group of questions, the lady at the back. And again, please introduce yourself and speak a bit louder. I should say that this is live streamed as well, so for the benefit of our virtual friends. Um, do you think that the World Bank's responsibility for and mission to tackle poverty, fueled specifically by bad governance, as you mentioned in Haiti, mm -hmm. is obstructed or might be obstructed in the future by newer um, other alternatives such as the BRICS New Development Bank, bearing in mind that they might not feel the same moral compulsions that you mentioned, and especially um, in 2017 with the U.S. President um, abdicating some of the moral leadership and the strong commitment to the U.N. that his country traditionally had, which um, I feel like is also visible with the absence of some world leaders at the U.N. General Assembly recently. Thank you. An easy question to answer. Um, <laughs> the gentleman at the front. Thanks. Uh, Robert Wade. I'm in the Department of International Development here at LSE. Uh, great pleasure to uh, hear you, Katarina. Um, I want to ask you about the IFC, that is the International Finance Corporation, in the context of financing oh. development. Um, the, just for those of you who don't know, the IFC is the arm of the World Bank that lends to private companies, not to governments. And the IFC lending has just exploded in the past few years to the point where one third of total World Bank Group lending is now from the mm. IFC. And just to mention two recent projects of the IFC, uh, one of them is a big loan to the German retailer Lidl to expand its operations in Eastern Europe. And the second one is to build a five-star hotel in Accra uh, by a company owned by a Saudi prince. Um, the point I'm making is that most, not all, but most IFC loans are loans to companies based in the rich countries in the West uh, for projects in the middle income countries, not in the low income countries. And they require a 20% rate of return. The IFC expects to enter projects which uh, will get a 20% rate of return. And on the face of it, it would seem that this uh, IFC lending, which is after all concessional lending, is competing directly with private lending. Because the question is, why would private enterprise not take up projects of this kind? Remember, this is now one third of total World Bank group lending. And it just seems Robert, is there a question hiding somewhere? Or? <laughs> the question is, are you, as CEO of the World Bank Group, concerned about the increasingly dominant role of this type of lending? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And one more question, perhaps the lady at the way back. Then we'll go upstairs, and then we'll come down. So please continue thinking of questions. I'm familiar that in 2014, uh, our bank report found that nearly one third of their PDF reports had never been downloaded. So nobody had really read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and only that, that uh, another 40% of the reports had only been downloaded a hundred times, less than a hundred times. So my question to you is, what role do you see research play uh, in the coming years? And what actions has the World Bank taken in order to address that situation? Mm -hmm. Thank you very okay. much. Um, I will start from the last question, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, well, if reports are be being written just for the sake of the uh, uh, 
authors uh, and not for the sake of development? My answer is chop, chop. Take budgets out from, you know, make, make research really serve. With the caveat that downloading is not a guarantee of policy impact. It may not be downloaded and may, it may still be something that has a, a significant policy uh, impact. Uh, but that reminds me in uh, the old days uh, when we lived under communism uh, and benefited from having lots of great jokes. Uh, there was a joke about uh, Chukcha. Have you heard Chukcha jokes? I'm looking at the Bulgarians. So Chukcha are people who kind of have great self-confidence but are not particularly educated. And Chukcha goes to a university and uh, uh, to study to be a writer. And uh, he is invited in a class and given a book. And he says, uh, Chukcha is a reader. Chukcha is a writer. Chukcha is not a reader. <laughs> so we had these people uh, clearly uh, uh, among us. Uh, but that is uh, uh, focusing research on what really matters, hugely important. What we have done in the bank recently is uh, to put the research department of the bank together with the operational units of the bank to report uh, to me. So research is being validated for significance and is flowing more easily to be operationally relevant. Uh, some people are worried that we may interfere with the independence of research, and I can tell you we have absolutely no, no intention for that. We are, we are retaining uh, ways to, uh, to scrutinize uh, to a certain degree because of the uh, point uh, you just made, that um, validity of research comes with the consumption of the uh, outcome of this research, and we have to stretch every dollar we have to the maximum. The first question is really a tough question. Uh, how do we operate in an environment that is uh, uh, less predictable than it used to be? Actually, the one thing we can say about predictability these days, unpredictable. Uh, we take I actually would take a much more optimistic and upbeat approach uh, answering your question. What do I saw in the United Nations this month during UNGA, when, as you said, some leaders didn't come, some came and made um, uh, interesting uh, speeches, <laughs> uh, is that actually the energy up, up. I have never seen so much engagement and, and positivism in many of the sessions inside, but in particular outside. Private sector there in big numbers, civil society organizations in big numbers. If I, I went to an event organized by the Gates Foundation where demonstrably we are making progress towards meeting the sustainable development goals in many places. And you can celebrate that uh, progress. We heard businesses and uh, communities from the United States saying loud and clear, the US will meet its Paris Agreement obligations. So I think what we would see is more uh, uh, diffused and therefore more difficult to bring together, but the sense of coalitions that are coming because this is the right thing to do. Uh, we from the bank do everything we can to bring everybody on board. You quoted uh, the uh, BRICS Bank. We actually work with the BRICS Bank. And uh, <laughs> for my sins, one of the first projects they are financing in Russia is in judiciary, judicial reform, a project that the World Bank developed and now is being uh, expanded. So we have to lean forward, we have to engage, we have to try to make it so that better action is being built. Uh, and of course, uh, you are there to watch us and criticize and push us and please do more of it. Uh, IFC, now I wanna start with full disclosure. I'm not the CEO of the World Bank 
Group. I am the CEO of the World Bank, meaning that I am responsible for IBRD. This is the part of the bank that uh, lends to middle-income countries, and IDA, the part of the bank that provides concessional finance. This being said, I take responsibility for the World Bank Group. We are one family. And I recognize that there have been investments done, but for that matter, also on the World Bank projects that might have not had the best possible development outcome. But that is changing. And I want to very, very clearly and honestly tell you, guys, this is not your grandfather World Bank group. It is a different place. Philippe, who is leading, who is the CEO of 5C, uh, just a couple of days ago, unrolled what he calls IFC 3.0. And it is a massive shift of IFC towards either countries. And the recognition that we ought to buckle up and be there where it is really otherwise unlikely for private sector to invest. Uh, does that mean that we are going to 100% swing? No, because we also have to worry about the viability of investment, so there has to be some lower risk investing in order to do more high risk investing. But it cannot be that we just do the low risk and go to, to you know, go home and go to bed. If you want to do that, well, not on our buck. And uh, it is not easy, stuff is sometimes uncomfortable, but majority of our people are totally on that page. Because people go to work for the World Bank mostly because, well, they, because they care, because they care about development. And it is, I'll tell you, do you want me to tell you why I felt in love with the World Bank? Do you want to know? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, please. 93, when I went and bought my blue suit, bank hires me. And the very, I am an environmental economist by training. The very first thing I did was to work on phasing out leaded gasoline in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And because the World Bank can bring everybody together, policy, analysis, some of these papers that you talk about, that shows the uh, health benefits of phasing out leaded gasoline, but then also bring investments so refineries can be revamped and uh, the uh, distribution set for gasoline can be adapted to switch from leaded to unleaded gasoline. Within 18 months, there was a massive swing. And uh, why, why was that so important? Because lead in gasoline causes health impact, more specifically affects the IQ of young people. So, the Bulgarians here, they are smarter because of the World Bank. And I, I felt I want to work in this place. I want to be part of the bank. And, I, and I, with all the deficiencies that occasionally, have every, as every big organization, we may present, that sense of serving with uh, the capacity of an organization that is global, but also local. We have offices in 140 places. It is public, but it is also private. To make, to be part of it, to be part of, 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 of force for good, incredible. Thank you very much. Uh, and as a true economist, I run statistics. So ask the World Bank to tell us how many former, how many LSE alumni are currently working at uh, the World Bank other than uh, Kristalina, there are 325 uh, at the World Bank and 408 at the World Bank Group, including the IFC. So it's actually quite a large uh, group of uh, people, and hopefully some of you will uh, join that uh, that uh, group very soon. I will go upstairs yep. now, and then we'll come back. And now we are recruiting, so those <laughs> recruit as well. <laughs> Please, so we'll start with the gentleman at the front, and then we'll pass it left to right. Just speak louder, please. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm Alex, and I'm a graduate student at the Department of Management. I would like to echo uh, the <coughs> statement that you mentioned about the private sector engagement. Because you were all correct to mention that Polda is never enough to achieve a global uh, 
target that we have. So, and I know the World Bank tried a lot to engage the private sector and go on board and bring it as much as possible. So do you bring any new strategies that mm -hmm. you would like to, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, incorporate as soon as possible? Especially in the area such as technology, because mm -hmm. I mean that there are like giant companies and it was already mentioned the example of the Facebook. Mm -hmm. the, kind of the second question is more close to the Simeon work in the World Bank and the doing business uh, index. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm coming from a country that it played a, a huge role in order to like bringing the regulation down and bringing the efficiency very high. And the biggest component was technological solutions. So are you thinking maybe adopting the doing business uh, index in a way that also to capture this technological uh -huh. investment as one of the, let's say, the tools that could be measured as an efficiency increase? Mm -hmm. And which is that country, just so we know? Georgia. Georgia, okay. Oh. Very good. Can you pass the mic uh, to the next? Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Iverina, and I study international migration and public policy at LAC. And I'm also one of the local Bulgarians contributing to sentient populations and living abroad. <laughs> <laughs> and my question is related to migration and demographics, which mm -hmm. is a particular issue in Bulgaria since it is in report that it's the fastest shrinking population mm -hmm. uh, country in terms of population in the world now. And you mentioned an example of a country that is growing so quickly in terms of population, and also a country that is declining. And do you think migration might be rather positive in light of the development in terms mm -hmm. of is there uh, there might be more efficient allocation in terms of human capital but also there's a lot of brain drain that means that people with less education and less human capital actually remain in the countries mm -hmm. of of uh, emigration and also there might be financial help from remittances but at the same time sometimes they might be invested in education so that mm -hmm. kids can leave the country as soon as they can. So there's quite a lot of delay on migration. And we understand the question. Thank you. And if you can pass it to the right. Yes, the lady there. Hello, my name is Rosa. I'm a PhD student at Oxford. Um, you already mentioned the Gates Foundation very briefly. So these private philanthropies are big and emerging mm -hmm. um, actors in the global aid system. So I'm wondering how does Mm -hmm. Yep. One more at the back. There was another. I'll pretend I cannot count to three. So the gentleman at the back, yes. <laughs> um, hello, my name is uh, Ioan. I'm studying here at LSE. I'm also from Bulgaria. Quite a similar question to Ivalina. Considering that Bulgaria has probably one of the, in Europe, probably the fastest deep population, so fastest shrinking population, what policies should be implemented in the, in the long run in Bulgaria? Sort of come to this dangerous trend. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, great questions. Uh, private sector engagement, what's new? Uh, what is new is uh, twofold. One, we have recognized that as good as our own projects may be, they cannot ever bring scale as necessary by, by, by uh, the needs of countries. And therefore, we have to concentrate much more on identifying why private investments are not happening, what are the reasons, what can be done through policies, what can be done by sharing the risk to increase that, uh, that flow. Uh, and the second thing that is new is that we are integrating much more the World Bank group, so the public and the private side of the World Bank group work more closely together. We call the first thing cascade because it is cascading down series of questions and answers. First question, can this project be done by the private sector alone in an in a environmentally and socially sound manner? Yes, no. If the an answer is yes, we don't touch which is not necessarily always the case. You know, we do projects that can be done by the private sector sometimes. Then second question, if it cannot be done the private sector, what is the reason? Policy, institutional, financial risk? And then can we deal with this reason? Yes, no. And then if, we, if the answer is no, it cannot be done by private sector, no, it cannot be fixed, then we ask ourselves, is this a role for us with discipline? you would say that is common sense. It is a common sense, but 
for a long time we have not been systematic and disciplined in thinking about our role to facilitate private finance, especially from big institutional investors. Uh, by the way, the pandemic bond I mentioned, big chunk of it was bought by institutional investors. So we also have to innovate to make it possible for money to back up uh, development objectives. As for doing business, uh, uh, we, we, we recently had a, a big discussion around disruptive technology and what is our role in it. And we concluded that, in fact, our role is mostly to insensitize others by doing what we are pretty good at, use of data. So I would let uh, Simeon, maybe he would like to, 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 to comment on specifically doing a business. Uh, let me go to the uh, migration and uh, um, shrinking populations, expanding populations. So what does it mean for a country like Bulgaria? We have to first ask ourselves, why are Bulgarians uh, packing their bags and going somewhere else and staying there? Now, for the benefit of my full disclosure, my daughter lives and works in Bulgaria. So I may be somewhere else, but I have done something um, over my lifetime. Uh, and it is, it is very often because there are better opportunities somewhere else. And people feel that, that this is an open and inclusive uh, world, so uh, you, we take these opportunities. But sometimes it is also because the perception, rightly or wrongly, is that there is still uh, way to go in terms of making uh, Bulgaria a country that has full dominance of rule of law, where institutions serve the people and not the people serve the institutions, where there is uh, uh, opportunity to invest. Now, some very good thing, uh, thing is happening in Bulgaria, and it is uh, startups. We see a big jump in, Bulgar in startups in Bulgaria. Uh, Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, was one of the 10 best cities, ranked as one of the 10 best cities for startups. So there, are, there is some, some dynamism there. Uh, and, I, and I hope that there would be more attention to why people are not staying, what can be done, what can be done with public policy uh, to get them to stay. But also, what we face is in, in Bulgaria now, shortage of labor. You go to the Black Sea, who is there? Ukrainians, Belarusians, in other words, we bring people to work in our country. Well, maybe we have to think more systematically how to make Bulgaria more attractive. If we are shrinking, maybe we can compensate by being more attractive uh, for migrants in a way that makes it possible for, for people to integrate. I was in Canada these last two days. Any Canadians here? It's a great country. It is such an inclusive society. The Minister of uh, Refugees is an Afga Afghan refugee, former Afghan refugee. The Minister of Women is a, uh, no, sorry, he's a Somali refugee. The, the, the Minister of Women is an Afghan refugee. People come in the country, but they are supported to be integrated. They are invited by families, families sponsor. Uh, uh, immigration. So Bulgaria can also learn from those that are successful because what happened in our country, as you know very well, was that a flow of refugees turned Bulgarians off because it was not very well regulated, it was not taught, taught uh, true. Uh, we have many Bulgarians in uh, countries like Moldova and Ukraine. They are, they are uh, Bulgarian origin living there. There could be a program that makes it more possible for, for, for them to come. Uh, but in the end, the big, the, the, the fundamentally, the answer to this question would be when Evelina, and I, I didn't hear the name. Johan. When you guys say, hey, great opportunity out there in Bulgaria, boom, on the plane, back home. <laughs> uh, so we have one more round. We have one more round if you. Yeah, 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 we energy. have one more round. We have. Um, just to mention on uh, one statistic that came uh, earlier this week here in the United Kingdom is of the new crop of students, the students that are just starting the uh, university year, 
uh, in terms of uh, percentages, what are the largest uh, groups? And actually, Bulgarians are number six. So, so new Bulgarian students outnumber yeah. this year German students, Spanish students, French students. So a very large group of Bulgarians choose to study here and not in Bulgaria. Perhaps it's one of the reasons that Kristalina mentioned, that it's not just to study, you also want to learn. Mm -hmm. And then the UK system provides that learning. The Bulgarian system still needs to... Um, provides a diploma. <laughs> provides a diploma, so still needs to catch up. I'm trying to be diplomatic. Uh, but that uh, some, some institutions are nowhere near where they should be, and not surprisingly, you and uh, you, you come. Here, here, here you are on uh, doing business. Yes, you are right. Uh, as we, as we, uh, as the World Bank develops further the doing business indicators, one set of indicators that the doing business team is already developing is public procurement, because a lot of corruption is happening in public procurement, even though on paper it looks like it's all legit. But then, uh, then you need to study the process, and then the next frontier is precisely what you said: technology and how to marry the merits the benefits of technology with better better governance one more round on this side and one lady was smart and she was all together <laughs> just raising her hand throughout the process so the lady <laughs> at the very back please uh, okay. sorry yes yeah. yes yeah. that's you yeah. just a bit louder please Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, how do you go about making sure that the World Bank's investments are used efficiently, mm -hmm. efficiently and how do you combat yep. that gender stigma? Yep. And then the lady in the middle who very quickly raised her hand. Thank you. Um, my name is Alessia. Thank you, Christina, for a nice speech. Um, our first question, which is, I suppose, a bit more personal, and that is, um, what is your piece of advice for young and ambitious women from the Balkan and the wider East European region who are very keen to foster the sort of socioeconomic progress. Um, what's the best way to go about it? Mm. What, what would you advise? Mm. And then the gentleman here at the front. Hmm. Okay. And welcome to this group on the next round. Okay, so I'll try to be short so we get uh, there. Uh, on the gender s uh, stigma for schools, we, uh, we have done a lot of work to figure out how to ensure girls to have access to education. Uh, for example, in Pakistan, in Punjab uh, province, uh, it was very difficult to convince parents to allow their girls to, to go to school. And then one of our colleagues said, why don't we then make the school to go to the girls? And we created uh, schooling arrangements in family houses, so neighboring kids would come and the teacher would be there and the, kids would, and the girls would be schooled. Uh, in uh, very massively, we use economic incentives. So it is easier for the families because there would be scholarships for the girls, for the boys as well, but for the girls. And then we would very carefully calibrate the uh, scholarship to be sufficient incentive for the family to put aside the stigma, stigma and to get the girl uh, in school. Uh, we also recognize the incredible importance of public figures taking a position in favor of girls going to school. Uh, the most successful place this has been done is Bangladesh, where we have seen drastic reduction in, in uh, uh, population growth, in fertility rates, partially because of a very successful enrollment program of girls to go to school. I worked uh, when I was Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid in one of the Sahel countries, 
where what I realized is that the most valuable thing is a goat. Uh, so what we did was we gave the girls, if they graduate uh, sixth grade at least, so girl graduates, she gets a goat, she brings it home. Whatever it takes. This is the, the, the me my message is that it is so absolutely paramount that we have to do whatever it takes, goat or not, <laughs> to, get, to get girls uh, to school. And by the way, one thing that I am a bit ashamed of myself and I would admit it here, we need women that do have the privilege to freely go to school, to stand up for girls and women who do not have this privilege. For many years in my life, I thought that being a feminist is not a good thing. You are either good or not. And I don't want to people to say, oh, because she's a woman, she gets this job. And that is wrong. Because there is a big gender gap. And until we close it, men and women, we have to be feminists. We have to close it because it is bad, not just for the women, for the girls. It is bad for society for this gap not to be to be, to be closed. Uh, so uh, when uh, Trudeau says, Prime Minister Trudeau says, I'm a feminist, I tweet. <laughs> Here it is. Um, uh, best, best way to go about successful, being a successful, succeeding as a woman. I have two pieces of advice, all based on my personal experience. Uh, one, you have to believe in yourself and not doubt your capabilities. Women, we are terrible. I can tell you every single job with the exception of this last one. No, with the ex starting from being commissioner for humanitarian aid to that moment, every job I would be called and I would say, oh, why me? There must be somebody that is better. You have to, to have, I mean, I, I can tell you in interviews, interviews, you interview a man and a woman. They both say you have five criteria. They bought me three and don't me two. The man comes to you and says, hey, look at me. I meet three criteria, plus I'm offering you my wonderful personality. <laughs> the woman comes and she says, well, I only meet three, three criteria. I don't know where I'm the best person. So my first advice to you is believe in yourself. And my second advice is uh, uh, knock on doors, build networks, have people to know you, don't be shy, apply, <laughs> move. And so I expect you to apply for a job at the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Oh, and, and do, do make sure that you have mentors, men and women. Don't go and talk to people. You don't know it all. You don't know what you're, what you're good at. Those that look at you, they can tell you. So build the support system that would take you up and up. Thank you. And there was uh, the question of the gentleman on... Um, uh, yeah, on the environment. I kind of thought... Where is Mr. Wade when I need him? He should have answered this question because he did a lot of research in the bank on that. Uh, this is one of, the, of these things that half, you know, half full. There are those who think that our standards are not high enough. And there are those that think that our st standards are too high. Rule of thumb, when you have when you are in this place, you're probably exactly in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, I, frankly, I think that our environmental standards help countries to succeed because you ruin your, your environment, you pollute your water, you pollute your air, you have uh, high uh, profitability, people have jobs, but they are sick. And sooner or later, they revolt against uh, pollution. They revolt against abuse of the environment. Uh, I have one uh, factual to state. Look at the policies that uh, other, or other development banks adopt. They adopt the World Bank policies. 
Uh, and yes, sometimes we might be overdoing it, and in this case we have to, we have to cali recalibrate. But most of the time, what we do for the environment is not just for the environment, it is for people. Thank you. Very quick round here, the gentleman there, the lady and the gentleman. And that will be the last, huh? Yes, Kristalina actually just flew from Canada a few hours ago, so that would be the last one. Thank you. The lady. Next. Uh, hello, my name is Jessica, and I'm an exchange student from the University of Hong Kong. So you mentioned just now you have an ambition to become a professor in your early age, but later on you uh, work, in, work for the World Bank, which is considered an international organization. So I would like to know, in your point of view, what are the advantages and disadvantages for an occupation in international organizations compared to agree with the average mm -hmm. Thank you. And there was a gentleman <laughs> at the back. Hello, uh, I'm doing A-level now in the city and I'm from the college. My question is, China has such a foreign policy from the that one of the initial agents in that of Asian infrastructure and national bank. In the future, how will World Bank have cooperation with mm -hmm. Chinese government or will I be cooperation or competition? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Great questions for the last round. Uh, India is uh, our largest program. And uh, in India, what we concentrate on is to work with the poorest pr provinces and to make sure that opportun opportunities are given to work on the difficult uh, problems, like uh, uh, cleaning up um, uh, Gandhi River's waters, uh, or helping India to provide sanitation to everybody in a very massive way or working on uh, urban transport so it can be uh, safer and more efficient. Uh, so we pick up, we work with the Indian government on these things that are really difficult and where experience from other countries can be helpful. But we also learn from India, as we learn from China, as we learn from everybody we work with. Uh, we learn from India, for example, that it can be that advancement in fintech in, uh, 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 in uh, mobile banking, in electronic banking, that this can be done with a big leap. Uh, and we want to take that experience to Africa and help African countries to do, to do the same. We also work with the government on critical policy issues, including we work with the government on internalizing what we have done with doing business for their own provinces. And uh, uh, Simeon had very uh, interesting visits in that regard. Uh, I heard in St. Petersburg, uh, President Putin and Prime Minister Modi talking about doing business and how they want to go up and up. In other words, we try to create also policy incentives for the government of India to make, uh, to make progress on what matters uh, most. But again, just to finish, our concentration is on problems that primarily are related to reducing, uh, eradicating uh, poverty. Uh, very, in, very uh, good question around uh, international organizations and uh, uh, comparison with academia. Uh, so here is the, the comparison. In academia, you have much more freedom, but maybe less impact. In international organization, you have a little less freedom because you, you are part of a big family, but you might have more impact. Uh, that is not always totally correlated because in academia you, you may come up with something that is a huge uh, discovery, a policy recommendation of massive nature, and then it can be adopted. But by and large, I felt that when I went to the bank, that what I 
think of and analyze, I actually can put it to work. And that I, didn't, I couldn't do uh, being, being just a, a professor. Do I miss being a professor? As you can see, I'm sitting here with you an hour and a half. I do. <laughs> this is fantastic to, to interact with, with young people. It kind of gives you very different uh, uh, energy. Uh, and there is actually this meet house where you can be an academic and a consultant in an international organization or move from here to there and back. Uh, so you are in the towel, you go down on ground, and then you go back. Uh, that, is, that is possible. Uh, the last question on uh, the um, China, on, on China, our relations with China and uh, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. We collaborate a lot. We have, a, we have joint programs. We actually prepare projects that Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank finances because we have more project preparation capability. We have sent to Asia Infrastructure Bank many World Bank staffers. Actually, I'll tell you a very funny story. I'm going to uh, Asia Infrastructure uh, Investment Bank to meet a, with one of the vice presidents, but I haven't seen the name. I just know that the operations vice president is going to come. Walking in the room, there is a uh, good old friend from the bank former colleague. I have no idea he works there. I said, oh, hi, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm meeting with you. So they, <laughs> they brain drained from us big time. Uh, but that is very good. Now, we, of course, also, there is some creative tension and competition. And that is not a bad thing. They, are, they have been working to be more efficient. We want to catch up. I want my bank to be agile, effective. And if a bit of competition forces us to do it, great, so be it. Uh, and on this note, uh, it is two minutes to eight. Uh, it is Friday, you guys have <laughs> places to go to. <laughs> I am very appreciative for making my homecoming 30 years later so enjoyable. Thank you very, very, very much.